Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Roseland United Methodist Church, and we're so glad to have you worshiping with us. I just, I'd like to highlight a few announcements that are, that are on the back of your bulletin. Today we'll begin a four to six week, um, a four to six week study on the book Crucial Conversations, and the study will be held in the office at 4 p.m. All are welcome to attend. Also, a thank you luncheon for our volunteers who help with the card ministry. Um, and there's more information on the back of the bulletin regarding that. The church will hold a, few, a flu clinic on Monday, September 20th, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And Roseland's pumpkin patch is coming. So exciting. And if you can help, there are sign-up sheets in the Welcome Center. Also, congratulations to the Roseland Christian Preschool on their 20th anniversary this month. I know we keep saying this every Sunday, but we just want to make sure that um, 
just to remember to celebrate and, and know that that ministry goes on every day, every school day here in, in our church. So we're excited to have that here. Um, the United Methodist Women's Susanna Circle Group is canceled. That was going to take place on September 14th. And also the Finance Committee meets this Thursday. So I hope you'll take a minute to read through the announcements or the, on the back of the bulletin and take it home so you can go over that and don't forget anything. Oh, would you stand for the call to worship? Almost forgot I had more to do. When we stand at the edge of fear and worry, When we stand at the edge of the world's pain and need, do not be afraid or discouraged. When we stand at the edge of loneliness, know that our God is always with us. And now our opening hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. standing for our modern affirmation. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives. 
whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. God, we come to your house today to give you honor and glory. Lord, we thank you for all the things you do for us. And we ask that you help us be the hands and feet out to those we serve. Holy Spirit, we bring to you our concerns. Lord, we lift up all those who were affected by 9-11 20 years ago and yesterday. Lord, comfort them. Comfort those who are in pain, who have health issues, COVID, who are grieving. We, of course, ask that you guide our leaders both here in our church, in local government, in our national and world. Give them the wisdom that they need to lead us. And now, Jesus, hear us as we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our next song is Change My Heart, O God. And when I read the sermon starter this week, I immediately thought about this song, about um, just how difficult it is to change. And we get so set in our ways. So as we're singing, I hope that you'll be able to really reflect on these words and allow yourself to be molded and changed throughout our day.
It's a change. <laughs> How many of you have an ashtray in your car? What's in your ashtray? Change. Change. And then when it can't fit in your ashtray, where does it go? Where does it go? In your pocket? Don't you like jingling around? You know, people think Santa Claus has come to town, you know. Uh, You know, eventually, kids or somebody else will have some sort of a drive, and they want you to empty out your change and bring it into the church. Or maybe it's the school, PTO, whatever. Um, But most of us really don't appreciate change. And let me illustrate it this way. Remember I did a message, I don't remember what church, but it was over change. And what I had, the people, at the, the, they were called greeters. They didn't have ushers, they were called greeters. And they gave them their bulletin and they gave them a little chunk of clay when they walked in. And they gave them this instruction. They said, uh, once Jerry begins the sermon, you're supposed to roll it in your hands. Why do you roll clay in your hands? Soften it. What happens if you don't? It's hard, and you can't shape it into anything, can you? So, you know, I got up and started preaching like this, and I didn't say anything at all about the clay. But I noticed probably about a third to half of the congregation started doing this, which meant two-thirds to half of the congregation weren't doing what? And so suddenly we came to that point in the message where I said, so everybody hold up your piece of clay. And they all did. I said, shape it into the form of a heart. Now, guess who could do it and guess who couldn't? The ones who had softened the clay could change. And the ones who, for whatever reason, didn't want to go through the hard work of softening the clay ended up with what they started with. Now, many of them, in all fairness, tried to catch up. And by the time they left, most of them had a piece of clay that would harden into the shape of a heart. But some of them had the same little stick like a piece of butter you cut off, and they probably threw it away. Or maybe it ended up in the change container in your car that's called an ashtray. But it illustrates this point about change. We can sing about it. We can talk about it. But... Oftentimes, we're not willing to do the work to get us in the place where we can do change. Has anybody here ever had unwanted change in your life? I just talked to a friend. Sounds like maybe going through some of that right now. Okay. Uh, Unwanted change. I got out of the Air Force in uh, 1983, and I was preparing to exit Chief Master Sergeant Jet. Loved the man. He loved John Wayne. I love John Wayne. He uh, helped me integrate my life into Carsville Air Force Base. Chief Jet was a great guy. And he said to me, Milner, with your unique set of skills, you're only going to get a job in one of two places, either with the State Department or the company, the CIA. And I said, well, I don't like being a spook. I like electronics, so I'm going to go ahead and send out resumes. And I did. I sent out 30 resumes, and I got some bites. One of them was a little company called Paradigm in Largo, Florida. And they hired me because they needed some... I was a Tempest Control Officer, the ComSec custodian for DOD out of Carswell Air Force Base back in 83. They hired me because of my security clearance, my classifications, and my ability. Uh, Paradigm had been awarded the Social Security contract. Anybody know what Social Security is? Nice. So they were replacing... I think Burroughs had the contract before them. They were replacing their systems with... Paradigm systems. It was called, it was a modified form of what we called response. Anyway, the bottom line is they originally the contract said they had to secure the communications between all the Social Security offices. Don't you think that's a good idea? In other words, if somebody intercepted the traffic, they couldn't get your personally identifiable information. Good idea, right? Anybody know that the government always goes with the lowest possible bid? So I got out of the Air Force. I thought I had a secure future. I thought I was going to be doing, uh, helping with the crypto side of uh, the Social Security contract. And then the government decided not to encrypt the data. So for the six or seven or eight years, Paradigm had that contract. And we got gobbled up by AT&T, became AT&T Paradigm. Uh, all of your personally identifiable information went across the, uh, 
between all the social security offices, none of it was encrypted. It was still hard to intercept, but guys like me could have easily intercepted it. You know the best way to keep a secret? Is to tell nobody about it. And so nobody knew. So as far as we know, there weren't any data breaches. But then again, there wasn't Facebook to tell the world back then either. So, but here's the bottom line. Somebody moved my cheese. Now, cheese is anything that you want, need, or desire. It's something you think that's going to make you happy in life. And I thought that I was getting out of the Air Force, which was a good place to start, and I thought that Paradigm, soon to be AT&T Paradigm, would be a great place to continue. I had a new wife. We had a new life, and I thought things were going well until the day that I was brought into the regional manager's office, and he told me that they didn't need a crypto guy. And then he said, we're going to make you a field engineer. And I'm thinking, I grew up in northwest Ohio, northeast Indiana. I don't want to work in a field. I'm, I'm tell, that's why I went to college, okay? And he said, no, 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 not, not fields. You're going to be working with computer equipment. And so I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, so I did, and here's how it works. Just in case you don't know what a field engineer does, uh, they call you when the system is broken down. And, and it usually breaks down at the worst possible moment, like payroll day. So you walk in and everybody's angry, they're upset, they're nervous. Uh, something important's not happening, and it's your fault because it's your equipment. And so uh, the truth is, there was only so much equipment, and I'd been trained on it, and it was easy to identify and fix, quite frankly. So I'd walk in and I'd replace a circuit card and uh, then the system would start working. And they'd think I was a hero. Yeah, uh, you know, hooray for the paradigm or paradine guy, they used to say. Uh, you, know, and, you know, you do that five or six times a day, you think you're John Wayne, you know. And I love that job. But somebody moved my cheese. That wasn't the job I got at the Air Force for. So anybody ever heard this phrase? It is, what's the second part of that? It is what it is. The second part is, it will be what you make of it. To illustrate that point even more clearly, let's say you get a splinter in your foot. It is what it is. You may not like it. You may be kind of weird and kind of masochist. You think, oh, that feels pretty good. But whatever it is, it is what it is. You have a splinter in your foot. You can talk about it, you can get three or four opinions about it, but it's still what? A splinter in your foot. So it's better if you want to identify the problem, you do something about it. Would you agree with that? So let's say for whatever reason you decide not to, four days later, you not only have a splinter in your foot, you likely have an infection. So now instead of the initial problem, you have two problems, and that's the way life is. Things happen. Things that we want, things that we don't want, things that we look forward to and anticipate, things that we try to guard against and prevent, but things happen. So whether whatever it is, your want, need, your desire, maybe even your demand, this has to always happen this way. This can never happen in any way. Wherever you're at on the spectrum on any issue in your life, personal, professional, family, financial, health, it is what it is. You get a diagnosis of prostate cancer and you refuse to enter into treatments and further diagnosis, what do you still have? And it has a chance to do what? Metastasize to spread. I have buried friends with various cancers because they just didn't want to believe it is what it is. Or they believed that somehow they weren't being faithful or strong in their faith if they sought prescribed medical treatments. It is what it is. What's the second part? It will be what you make of it. That's an important principle. It really is. Um, I did leave the Air Force, and the truth is that wasn't the last time somebody moved my cheese. It just wasn't. You know, I ended up coming back to Largo. AT&T bought um, uh, Paradigm. And part of the buying was I went from being an engineer that wore a suit and tie, literally. And sometimes I'd have to take that off and put a little doctor's coat on to work on a chain printer. Uh, but still, 
I like my job, company car, celebrities, you know. Um, my uh, tool case was a, looked like an attache case, you know. I thought I was James Bond, for crying out loud. John Wayne and James Bond, how can you go wrong, right? And then uh, AT&T bought us, and they took a contract with, uh, it was called VSAT. They were going to install and maintain satellite dishes on top of 7-Elevens. Do you know how many 7-Elevens there are? It got worse. They were also going to do it for Kmart. So can you imagine a guy who drives a celebrity, wears a suit and tie, now driving a van with ladders on it? And I like to work with my hands, but I don't, couldn't imagine myself climbing on top of a Kmart or a 7-Eleven, 18 below zero, with wind and snow. And so I looked for an opportunity because somebody had moved my cheese. And I didn't like the taste of the new cheese. Has anybody had an experience like that? Could have been in a relationship. Could have been in your finances, maybe a financial advisor. Could have been a downturn in the market, an upturn, a new opportunity. But something changed that prompted you to look at new opportunities. Anybody ever do that? Most of us. Now, if you were six, I wouldn't expect you to raise your hand. But if you're at least 16 or older, I would expect you to begin to understand what we're talking about this morning. We are talking about the fact that change happens. It is what it is. Some is wanted, some's not. Some is desired, and some is so undesirable, we'll deny the reality of what is. So here's something to get us into God's word on this issue. Read it with me, will you? Would you? Joshua, one of the judges... Joshua 1, nine, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will go with you wherever you go. What's the last word? So you don't need the rest of those words if you're not willing to what? Yeah. You don't have to be strong and courageous to do the same thing today that you did yesterday. You don't need to be strong and courageous if your health is exactly the same way today as it was last week, last month, last year. You don't have to be strong and courageous if your marriage is exactly the way it is today, 20, 30, 40 years after you said, I do. But for most of us, most of us are willing to at least recognize that it is what it is and it ain't what it used to be, okay? Um, This lesson applies in every aspect of life, including our church life. The truth is we are hardened against change. And probably no more hard in our heart towards change than in the church of Jesus Christ. And that makes sense. It does to me, and I think it should to you. How many of you realize that the world today, America, is not what it was in 1960? How many of you are upset by that? I'm not saying I surrender all, but I'm saying let's be honest. It is what it is. I I grew up in a time probably similar to you. I mean, I grew up and my mom would say, see ya in the summertime in the morning, and somebody somewhere in the five-mile radius of my house would feed me, you know, and then they'd send me home um, before supper time. And that was just expected and normal. We didn't lock our doors. Anybody else have a house you never locked the doors on? Yeah, we didn't do it. We didn't need to. Besides, somebody might need something would have to come in. Why would you lock your door? You know, we just did that. So it was a different world. Um, It's changed. You not only want to lock your door, you want to have an alarm system, right? So we live in a different world. It is what it is. So what are we going to do about what is other than be fearful? The Lord says, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, because the Lord will be with us wherever we go. So the Lord is not locked into 1960. The Lord is here and present in the same powerful way in 2021. There's a great book, um, uh, and I do recommend it to everybody to read. It's a short read. Uh, You can get it anywhere at this point in time. It's been out for a long time. Anybody read Who Moved My Cheese? Anybody? Quite a few. I'm really, I'm glad. It's a great book. Here's the basic premise. <clears throat> there are four characters that are in a maze. And of course, it's not a very big maze, but uh, you've got two mice, and their names are Sniff and Scurry. Sniff and Scurry. Sniff is always sniffing out change. 
So Sniff is always open to the new. You got any friends that like the newest technology? They're like Sniff, okay? And then Scurry. Scurry figures out the benefits fairly early on, so he's going to scurry after it. So uh, new cheese. Uh, how many of you have the latest iPhone? I don't. I still have an Android, okay? It, it can tell me where I'm at, where I'm going, but that's about all I can do, which is better than my last phone before that. I think it was a flip phone, okay? So, but Sniff and Scurry, they're the two mice in the story, and they are early adopters to change. You have kids that are like that. Do you remember VCRs? Do you remember those? What was the biggest annoyance? The flashing lights. I went to my dad's house so many times. Dad, this is how you set the time. And he couldn't get it. No, actually, he wouldn't get it because it got me over to his house, right? So sniff and scurry, one is right on the bleeding edge of new technology. One is an early adopter. And then you move into two little people that are in that same maze. And they're him and haw. Not hee-haw. Do you remember hee-haw? Buck Rogers? No, Buck Rogers was the, the space guy. Buck Owens, yeah. And Roy Clark, right? So, but it's not hee-haw, it's him and haw, all right? Him uh, grouses about all change. He's not interested in change, doesn't want to change. You know, I, they're chasing cheese. Remember, cheese is whatever it is that you want, need, or desire. So they're chasing cheese. They found cheese at Station C. They're so excited. I got all the cheese I'll ever need. Uh, but Sniff and Scurry realize cheese is getting smaller and smaller. So they start looking for other stuff, and they eventually find it at Station N. All right, so they're happy with the new cheese. But meanwhile, him and Hall are still back at Station C where the cheese is running out. In fact, it's getting a little old, a little stale. Uh, the cheese today pretty much chase, tastes like the cheese yesterday and last year and the year before. But they're not going to go anywhere because they're comfortable in the status quo. Well, him begins to really realize that there's not enough cheese to go around. And so he, against his better judgment, sneaks off and eventually runs in to sniff and scurry over at the new station with plenty of new cheese. But Hall gets angrier and angrier, more and more depressed because this is where the cheese is supposed to be. This is what the cheese is supposed to taste like, and all those other people are wrong. Now, let me put a fine edge on that wonderful story. Much of the church that thinks... The gospel of Jesus Christ is dead and dying is Haw. Not even him. We're Haw. God is the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever. Right? So the God who's done all these wonderful things in the history of the church, not just in the United States, not just in this century, but throughout the world in all centuries, is still active and still loves all of his children. But things are changing. And they've changed. You've already admitted it here. And it's not just not locking the doors on your house. It's about unlocking our hearts to change. While it can be difficult, it can be awfully beautiful. So here's the question. If we're unwilling to change, if we stay at Station C doing what we've always done, what eventually is going to happen? You're going to run out of cheese. You're going to die. And you're going to be angry, especially at all those traitors who've gone somewhere else, right? So here's the fine edge to this beautiful story. God wants us to be adults. God wants us to be faithful. Filled Christ followers. Lessons from who moved my cheese. Because change happens. It's not just in the church. It's not just in our finances. It's not just in our marriage. It's not just in our health. It's, it's in all aspects of life. God has created a world that's in constant change. And we don't get to vote on that. It just is what it is. So we need to develop an action bias. If you recognize change is happening, you need to plan to adjust the sails in your life to catch the new wind. Otherwise, you're going to be calmed, be becalmed on the open sea. So we've got to develop this action bias. And action bias basically means this. Uh, you should always think before you act. Do you agree with that? But what happens instead of 
spending 10% of your time thinking something through and then acting the 90%, what happens if you reverse that? And you think about it 90% of the time and only have 10% of your time left to do it. Will you get it done? No. It's called the paralysis of analysis, where you think thinking about it is doing something about it. Newsflash, doing something about it is doing something about it. I'm not saying shoot from the hip, but I am saying 10%, 90%. Plan and do. So don't overthink. Be more like sniff and scurry. Not like him and ha. And overthinking often sounds like in the latter part of this reality, it's complaining, complaining. All right? So another lesson. Anticipate change. Did you know nothing lasts forever? Is anybody still driving their first car? I wish I was. <laughs> 68 Firebird, but there you go. All right, so nothing lasts forever. So avoid this idea of dependence. And what follows is entitlement. There was a moment in American history, recent American history, that revealed a changed character in our country. Hurricane Katrina, anybody remember that? Oh, yeah. There was a moment, and I remember watching the TV, and I just was so confused. And then I became angry, and then I became convinced. The moment was this. People necessarily had to flee to higher ground, and they went inside of one of the largest Super Bowl domes we ever had. Remember the Superdome, right? And they filled it up, and then they turned around, and they made this plea to the world. Come and what? Help. Rescue us. You know, when somebody can't help themselves, for crying out loud, find out what it is that they're struggling with and help them. But don't make them dependent upon you. One of the things that always define the American character is this. We'll help ourselves, and we'll help who? Our neighbors. We will. But you know, one of the things, again, and at Fine Edge for this came to me, we took a team for cleanup up to, and we staged it out of a Methodist church somewhere on the Gulf Coast, up there for Katrina. And they wanted us to come in and do for them, but they wouldn't pick up a hammer and help us rebuild their house. And I was just like, and some of the guys that were hired like me said, Jerry, this feels wrong. We feel like we've been hired to do their work. And so something happened in the character of the church. They became dependent upon others doing for them even what they could do for themselves. And we call that what? A sense of, and that makes most doers angry. So, but it is a natural part of this process of change. You can get depressed. You can become angry. You can become disappointed to the point where you just kind of sit and soak. And even when people come to help, you will remain in that helpless state. So ask yourself, in every area of your life, again, this isn't just about church, it's not about disasters, it's, not, it's about your health and your finances, it's about your relationship with your kids and grandkids. Ask yourself, what is diminishing? When was the last time, uh, just to broaden the scope here, when was the last time you had a meaningful conversation with your kids or grandkids? When was the last time you didn't throw something at the TV when you watched news from a channel you don't normally watch? How will you know what is diminishing in the world around you, even the closer circles of family and friends, unless you are engaged? Ask yourself, what is changing? What is diminishing? Look around and ask the corollary to that. What is working? You know, the truth is the church of Jesus Christ is not dying. It's in one of the most explosive growth periods of its life. And not just overseas, but here in the United States. So when we, inside of the maze, are acting like him and haw, saying, well, you know, people just don't go to church anymore, that's a lie. They do go to church. Well, people just don't sing Christian songs, that's a lie. A third of the music that fills the airwaves in America and around the world is Christian music. A third. There's not a lot of organ music <laughs> being transmitted, but I like organ music, but, you know, that's just part of who I am. So... It's a two-edged sword. Ask what's diminishing, what's changing, and then look around, what's working today?
the third question that comes from this book I really do hope you read, it's based, really, it's based on this, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you want. Go. In other words, change. The third one is this, develop an abundance versus scarcity outlook. When you have an abundance mentality, you are honoring God. You're saying God is a God of infinite resources. God is a God of infinite variety. There's always more to be found. So if you see what's diminishing in your marriage, you see what's diminishing in your relationship with your kids, your career, your health, look for where God is providing more. If you lose your eyesight, what inevitably becomes true about your hearing? It gets better, more acute. It's the way God has wired the universe. So don't focus on what's diminishing. Focus on what God is now providing. You may have loved your eyesight, but suddenly you can hear things you could never hear before. So have the courage to let go, to embrace what? What is, all right? And what the God of abundance is providing. And when you do that, when you share God's continuing faithfulness in your changing circumstance, you have a witness. And it's not a witness to your courage. It's not a witness to your tenacity or fortitude. You have a witness to the faithfulness of the one who gave you life and sustains your life even when it has changed. And that is one of the most powerful things you'll ever share. But when you begin to do it, you have joined the great cloud of witnesses the church triumphant that takes the blessings of God even in the discouragement of life and turns those blessings back to praise. And you will find no greater rocket fuel for your life than that. So when change happens, develop this abundance mentality. So God is in the business of moving our cheese. You may not like the change, but don't blame God, but look for what God wants to do in it. There we go. Read this with me, would you? From the prophet Isaiah. <coughs> Excuse me. Forget the former things. What? Really? Really? Forget? But I loved it back then. I did. You know, I loved it when I was in the Air Force. I had a 42-inch chest and a 30-inch waist. You know what I've got now? I've got furniture d disease. My chest has fallen into my drawers. Okay? God says... Don't become bitter, become better. Forget the former things because God is doing a new thing and it may just be a much better thing. So do not dwell on the past. Read the rest with me. See, I am doing a new thing, says the Lord. Now it springs up. Do you not see it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The promise through the prophet Isaiah wasn't just for them then, it's for us now. God is not done creating. You know, the greatest example of this is actually the people uh, that Moses led out of Egypt. You know, within a few weeks, they were happy. Yo, we're leaving Egypt. Yay! Go, Moses! You the man! But within a few weeks, they began to what? Complain. They, they said to him, they said, are you kidding us, Moses? Better that we would have died back in Egypt than starved to death here in the desert. You know, it, at least we had a place to sleep and food to eat. We got nothing out here. And Moses gets mad and hits a rock with water, or, and water comes out of the rock. You remember these stories. God provides manna from heaven, you know, and they complain. I wanted a croissant, not daily bread. And we laugh at them, but we have to laugh at ourselves. That's a mirror into our own soul. We get into times of adversity, we get into times of change, and uh, we don't want to embrace that it is a new reality. And we begin to complain against the change. And we begin to complain against the ones that are embracing the change, the sniff and the scurry. And then maybe we're him and catch up with the change, or we're like Haw, and we think the change is from Satan. But God says, I'm doing a new thing. Look for me in the desert and watch for the streams of life and what you thought was nothing but death. So Jesus gives us a parable on this issue. It's called the parable of the wicked tenants. Anybody know what a hostile takeover is? 
What is it? Right, exactly. You can do that through stocks. You can do it through maneuvering in the board. There's all kinds of ways where somebody can take over your company. Can anybody remember the name Milliken? He was really good at that. He'd take over a struggling company, one that wasn't handling change very well. He'd take controlling interest, and then what would he do? Sell it. And so literally millions of people lost their livelihoods and their retirements because of that guy's greed. So a hostile takeover can happen anywhere. In the parable Jesus is giving, he's talking about a hostile takeover in the spiritual world. He's talking about a hostile takeover in the temple. And it's a hostile takeover that can happen in the church. In fact, I get a little bit of trouble with this picture, but if you play chess, there's two pieces in play there. What are the two pieces? No, that's a bishop. A bishop and the king. And what's the bishop trying to do? Top over the king. You're hearing from me. You know, I'm not saying this is endorsed uh, by anybody else beyond me, but it is the truth. If man's word, including the Episcopal authority in any church, stands over and against the word of God, that's what's happening. It's a hostile takeover. All right? Man's word always is subject to God's word. And if anybody preaches something different to you, you better understand it is what it is. It's a hostile takeover. All right? So let me put the point on this through Jesus' parable. Uh, Read this with me, would you? Jesus said, and this is a story he's telling them about this reality, then and today. A man planted a vineyard, built a wall around it, dug a pit for pressing grape juice, and built a lookout tower. So we know right away it's a Methodist vineyard. Okay? Uh, And then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and moved to another country. At grape picking time, he sent one of his servants to collect the share of the crop. Does anybody know what they did to that servant? Oh, no, they just beat this one. They grabbed the servant, they beat him up, and sent him back empty-handed. They wanted to give the owner a message. Okay? Then the owner sent another servant, but they beat him and treated him shamefully, and that's the revised for church ears version of that, but you probably have a good idea. All right? Uh, the owner then... Oh, yeah, we did that guy. So others were sent... And they were either beaten or killed until there was only one left. Who? His son. The owner sent him thinking, surely they will respect my own son. But the farmer said, read it with me. Let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they murdered him and threw his body out of the vineyard. It's a hostile takeover. You know, we have a track record of idolizing our chief. The things that, especially when you've clawed your way up a ladder, it doesn't matter if it's corporate, now you're the top dog in the junkyard. It doesn't matter whether it's in a church system or any other system. Uh, When you have power, you don't want to give it up. All right? So here's here's the situation that Jesus is pushing against. Um, They, uh, they being the the, uh, Judaizers, they being the Jewish leaders, uh, have decided that God is on their side, and anybody who disagrees with their understanding, their interpretation, uh, then God is against them. So, uh, bottom line, Jesus has come to earth. Do you think that moved their cheese? Why would it move their cheese? How would you like to be the top dog in a university and some young buck comes along and says, you've heard them say, but truly I tell you. How would that make you feel? A little threatened? Maybe not to the point where you'd plot the guy's demise, but that's what happens. So they're not really thrilled with what he's talking about. Uh, Let me illustrate it this way. Anybody know what squatter's rights are? Squatter's rights are when you don't own a property. It's not been leased or rented to you, but you decide to take up residence. All right? So you're living there, and if the owner doesn't know you're living there, what happens? After seven years, you own it. That's the technical law here in this state. So would it be smart to take a look at your your property if you own any, by the way? All right. And if you discover them, you actually have to go through an eviction process if if they were a lease E or a rentor. Okay. So that's basically what's happened in Israel. 
uh, God has established the nation and given them the laws and the prophets. They killed and ignored them. And then God has sent their only son and Jesus knows they're going to kill him too. They think they've got squatters' rights. Who owns this world and everything in it? God. So we are tenants. That's all we are. And we have tenants' rights because of the character of God. He's not going to you know, do something outside of his character towards his children. But the truth is, it's God's world. They thought, and religion over and over again gets to the point where they think the religion is above God that we somehow have locked in what God is and who God is and how God will act or react. And as soon as you do that, we're right back to the heart of what Jesus is pushing against in this parable of the wicked tenants. The church cannot decide that it will ignore part of God's word. And when it does, bad things are about to happen. So here's the deal. We can disagree with God's word. We can discuss it back and forth. But when you pull out an eraser and try to erase it to make it say what you want it to say, you've just moved into the wicked side of this tenant equation. So the prophets describe the people of Israel as, as God's vineyard, and they describe the leaders of Israel as God's vine dressers. Uh, so the owner was patient. He sent messenger after messenger. He gave them the law. He gave them the prophets. And then he sent his son. And they ignored and killed all of that. It's like what happened at Temple Bethel. Uh, the the uh, rabbi got in a heated discussion over an important issue inside of a board meeting. And the board president said, well, clearly you don't agree with us. And, but we're the board. And he says, my friends... Torah clearly says this is what God expects. We can't go against what God's expectations are. And so the president said, we're a democracy. Anybody believe in democracy? I do. But it has its limitations. It does. They said, we're a democracy. So we'll put it to a vote. Turned out 11 to 1. All of the board voted against the rabbi. Suddenly, there's this huge Bolt of lightning comes down from heaven, splits the board table in two. Everybody's thrown to the floor. After a few minutes, the board president rises to his knees and says, all right, 12, or no, 11 to 2, but majority still wins. The majority, when it disagrees with God, still what? Loses. We're in a day and time where somehow... People think we can outvote God. We can't. And it's foolish to think we can. Mark 12, verse 10 through 20, describes who Jesus is. Read it with me, would you? Didn't you ever read this in the scriptures? The stone rejected by the builders has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous to see. You see, they knew that this parable that Jesus was speaking was spoken against who? Them. The Jewish leaders wanted to arrest Jesus because they realized he was pointing at them. They were the wicked farmers in his story, but they were afraid to touch him because of who? The crowds. You know, in America, the gospel truth could be preached without fear up until recently. And I'm narrowing it down to just the United Methodist Church. But even when I came through the board process, I had friends from Asbury going to other, other conferences, and they were told point blank, because you're going to Asbury, we're going to scrutinize your theology more closely. And so an evangelical, somebody who believes there is one God and three natures, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, believes in the divinity of Jesus Christ, eternal God and yet man, who believes in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit and the need for each human being to be born again and the power of that Spirit. For people who still believe that this word is the word of God and will preach it without fear, they were told, because that's who you are, you're not welcome here. And that was in just a few conferences. And now it's almost ubiquitous. Let me get that word right. Ubiquitous. You say it. Let's see how well you do. 
okay? Some words are easy, like easy, but ubiquitous is not easy. All right, so, but now it's true across the conference. And this conference used to be one of the more conservative and traditional conferences, and it has changed. It's changed dramatically. So it is harder to be an evangelical Christian and an evangelical pastor in the United Methodist Church to the point where people go, I didn't know any guys like you still existed in the Methodist system. I hear that a lot. I also hear, are you sure you're not Baptist? I am Wesleyan to my shorts. I understand the justice of God, but grace trumps God's justice. That's the story of Jesus Christ. But God's love and God's word are still the cornerstone. We can argue about the application. We can disagree on the interpretation. But God's word stands. So what was true in Jesus' day, where the crowds protected him, was once true in America, where we were basically a Christian nation. It was once true in the church of Jesus Christ, where we were basically a Trinitarian understanding. is no longer true. So what happened in a matter of weeks in Jesus' life has now happened in a matter of years here in the United States. Because these ones who left him because of the fear of the crowd would come back when they could control the crowd and they would crucify him. And the truth is being crucified today. It just is. What does the Lord require of us? To love justice, to do mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. We're not called to strike out in anger. We're not called to denigrate or dehumanize people who have different opinions. When we do that, we've switched sides. We're now swinging a sword of evil and not good. Because this is the truth, and this is the fine point I want to put on all this. God loved those wicked tenants, the ones that rejected the law and killed the prophets, the one that murdered his son. God still loves them. Not just then and there, but here and now. It was Christmas time in Sarasota. We rented two trolleys. Um, each trolley held about 30, 35 people. And we went around uh, in all the different neighborhoods and looked at the Christmas lights. Anybody ever do that? Looking at Christmas lights? Isn't that fun? So we did that, and there was a friend of mine, Ron, who I'd brought into the church. Uh, he and Dee, and they had a little itty-bitty boy and, and two stir stepdaughters. And uh, I think it was Marin, the middle daughter, didn't feel well, so she crawled up in her daddy's lap. And he's sitting there holding her tight, saying, honey, it'll be okay. And then Marin threw up. And I don't mean threw up, you know, in a pleasant way. I mean, she threw up to where you're like, how could they get that much in that little girl? You know, and so he's just covered. And you know what he did? I mean, I'm like, oh, I don't want to be anywhere but in this trolley. I wish I'd got on the other trolley. Uh, but he held his daughter even tighter. And she continued to throw up, and he stroked her hair. He said, honey, it'll be all right. I'm here. I love you. This is how God responds to people on both sides of these very divisive issues. God loves the wicked tenants because this story is more about a crazy in love with us God than it is about crazy people who think we have squatter's rights. God loves us. All of us. Ron taught me the truth of this parable on that ride. A hostile takeover is taking place. It is what it is. I'm not asking you to choose sides. I'm asking you to choose love, to choose kindness, to choose mercy, to choose to remain in conversation, to understand what they're thinking and feeling. It doesn't mean you agree with them, but it means you will never dehumanize them because Jesus Christ died for them. And who are we to spit on the grave of Christ? Those who have ears to hear, listen. Amen? Amen.
Would you stand as we sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. bonus question for you. You get 10% off your tithe if you can answer it. What's an Ebenezer other than, you know, Scrooge? I mean, you know, what is an Ebenezer? What is it in that song you just sang, here I raise my Ebenezer? Does anybody remember? Look at that, our tithes are safe this week. Woo! An Ebenezer is simply a milestone that says, thus far, the Lord has been faithful to me. And that gives me assurance that God will continue to go with me wherever I go. Raise your Ebenezer. I don't know what the future holds. God never gave me a crystal ball. But I know the one who holds the future. Trust in God's goodness. Walk in God's grace. And you will discover joy even in times of trial. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'll see some of you at 4 o'clock over in the church office for crucial conversations. How to stay in communication with people that you disagree with. I think it's a good course for these times.
understand? I was kind of hungry.